From Washington to Warsaw, Paris to Ankara, Brussels, Berlin, Bucharest, and Belgrade. Through pandemics and political movements, cooperation and confrontation, digital divides, and defending democracy. The German Marshall Fund is at the pulse of transatlantic relations today, convening the experts and insights needed to navigate tomorrow's world. Good morning and good afternoon to everybody that's logged on. On behalf of the German Marshall Fund of the United States, I'd like to thank you for joining us for our Transatlantic Tuesday. Um, this is the second one in 2021. My name is Suda David Wilp and I'm based in GMF's Berlin office. Um, today we're going to talk about progressive politics and how progressive politics have um, become an increasing force within political parties and the body politic on both sides of the Atlantic. And before I introduce our great speakers today, I'd like to thank our Business Alliance Council for making this program possible. Uh, those members are Bayer, Deloitte, Google, and Pfizer. And um, as some of you all know, we are going to just have a brief conversation with the panelists and then we'll go straight to Q&A and you all can start um, you know, posing questions in the Q&A um, uh, function and they'll queue up and I will call on you or mention your questions um, to our speakers about um, in about 25 minutes. So we have two expert speakers on progressive politics. Our first speaker is Oana Soyu. She's an elected member of the Chamber of Deputies in the Romanian Parliament and she's president of the Labor and Social Protection Committee in the Parliament. She's also a um, former state secretary in the Ministry of Labor and Family in um, Romania, and much of her work focuses on family policy, social inclusion, and social business law. She is also the co-founder of um, Social Innovation Solution, a think tank and incubator in um, Romania, investing in entrepreneurial education with the goal to engage and connect young entrepreneurs and public policy officials at home. Uh, I'm also very pleased to mention that she is a GMF, a Mar Marshall Memorial Fellow alumna, um, and she's been part of the network since 2014. Our second speaker is Zach Exley. He's a, a former senior advisor to Senator Bernie Sanders and was a key member of um, Senator Sanders' 2016 election campaign. He's also the co-founder of New Consensus, a group that promotes the Green New Deal, as well as the co-founder of the left-wing political committees, Justice Democrats and Brand New Congress. He co-authored Rules for Revolutionaries, how big, organi big organizing can change everything based on it, on, can, sorry, can change everything. And the book is based on his experiences um, on the um, set, um, presidential campaign of um, Bernie Sanders. So maybe I'll start out with a broad question. And Wano, if you can start, uh, what does progressive politics mean for, um, maybe you can talk about Romania, but then also um, the larger frame of the EU um, or Europe? And then Zach, I'd love to turn that question over to you after. Oana, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for having me here. It's always a pleasure to come back to the GMF family in whatever shape or form. Uh, so I'd like to say hello to the attendees as well. Uh, the, the bad part of being online is that I don't really get to, to see them, but I'm looking forward to an offline event when that would be safe and possible. Uh, it's always a challenge to me to talk about progressive uh, politics with uh, across the Atlantic, because for example, in Romania or in Europe, if you say something like, access to public health care or to free education or any any of those they are not considered progressive they are considered the point where you start the conversation uh, in any in any shape or form for example my party which is plus stands firmly on this on this platform but we're a center center right party right uh, so i'm moving a bit from from the policy rather to the representation part uh, maybe slightly because in our in our case what was a bit controversial or what was something that new let's say that that we brought forward was our forms of making sure 
sure that women, young people, and the rural environment uh, is represented in, in politics. And that for us has meant uh, proactive recruitment in, in one sense, but it has also meant, for example, directly quotas in terms of young candidates below 40, or in terms of the making sure that we have women candidates within our internal, internal poll of primary elections. Okay, um, so it's more about inclusion and diversity, I guess. Um, and Zach, what about you? How, what, how do you describe progressive politics um, when talking to an American audience? But maybe also, I know you tra you've traveled extensively before the pandemic hit. So how do you explain progressive politics to um, audiences in Europe as well? Oh, you're on mute. I'm sorry, Zach, you're on mute. All right, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, the labels are so difficult um, always. And, um, you know, we in, in the United States, you know, we've gone through this whole evolution of, of labels for kind of left and le left of center politics and parties, as, as I'm sure most of you know. And, and for a while, it was really uh, difficult to talk between Europe and the United States. I, I worked on some campaigns in uh, Britain in 2005 and uh you know pr they didn't want to have any part of progressive you know the like the labor party who i was working with uh you know you know it didn't matter whether it was the more right-leaning people or the more left-leaning people everybody was against this progressive label and um uh, i was actually kind of against it too because the progressive label in the united states actually has a terrible history you know pr uh, progressivism was a really bad movement <laughs> uh, back in the, you know, in the late 1800s and, and early 1900s. Um, they were the people who spearheaded eugenics, you know. Um, I mean, like European fascists got a lot of their ideas from American progressives. Uh, it was, um, you know, they, they, they it, it was a really bad movement. So in, in a lot of ways, and yet at the same time, they were in favor of you know, kind of using science, whatever that was at the time, um, you know, to try to make progress on important issues like public health. And there were some really big public health victories that came out of the progressive movement, but there were also just all these other terrible public policy failures, um, you know, that we're still grappling with. So then the progressive label kind of had a resurgence when, um, Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton, and you know, a bunch of, um, lip, you know, kind of center, center left or center right, you know, in Europe, it would be center right uh, politicians, they didn't want to call themselves liberals anymore. Uh, I don't know how well known this story is in Europe, but, but basically, we started using this progressive label because the Republicans and conservatives really demonized this word liberal. Um, and uh, and so, so Democrats who had called themselves liberals um, started calling themselves progressives. So, okay, so that's a little history of the labels and why I have a hard time with, with the label progressive sometimes, but there's kind of, it, it's just the only catch-all label right now that, that uh, like Oana said, you know, refers to anybody who cares about, you know, trying to use politics and trying to use government um, and civil society to do things like provide basic human rights, like healthcare, education, stuff like that. It, if you believe in that, then you can be called a progressive in America today. Um, and as weird as it is, we a whole half of our politics and a half of our population, the Republicans and everybody that kind of follows the Republicans, they actually believe that the that the government and society has no role in providing healthcare, even providing education. Uh, so, so that's kind of what it comes down to. You know, do you or don't you believe in just in providing some basic rights uh, to to people? And even the center of the Democratic Party and the mainstream of the Democratic Party has kind of uh, become okay with this progressive label. In fact, they were really the ones that brought it back. But, but there is today, just in this moment, you know, this is a very recent thing, that sometimes the, the, the split in the Democratic Party is represented as the split between the center and progressives. So, you know, 
that's where we are in our weird two party system where yeah. all the politics has to fit into two parties, you know? <laughs> no, it's, it's so true. And I definitely want to get more into the details about, you know, the fragmentation in the democratic party. There's certainly fragmentation on the other side of the aisle as well in the Republican party, but maybe, um, so the way you describe both of you describe, um, you know, the progressive politics is about inclusion, diversity, but also sort of basic rights that the government should provide to its, a lot to its to its citizens, right? And um, I guess I'll ask you, Awana. I mean, how do you think that um, relates to you know democracy right now in Europe? Because you know when you campaign as a politician, you're an elected official. You want to reach for the stars. You want to talk about big ideas, and you you want to you know convince people of what you stand for. But then when you get into government, it's harder sometimes to move things along, especially um, when there is gridlock in a legislative system or polarization. So how does that affect um, progressive politics if sometimes governments fail to deliver? Because democracy is not easy today. And, and I'd love for you to also comment on this, Zach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. So one of the things that, that we, see, uh, we see in Europe and especially in Romania is that we see an increase in the apathy of voters at some point, right? So through the process when they weren't necessarily reflected in the ideas that they saw with politicians, but specifically in the value system, I, I would say that rather than concrete actions, also the value system that they saw, they saw in politicians, they gradually stepped out of the of the democratic process of voting, let's say. So what we see in Romania, but also in other parts of, of Europe is that with the birth of new parties, let's say, and this is the case of my, my party as well, which is we are at the first elected term, let's say, uh, that, that especially young people or in our case, young families have stepped back into the decision-making process while, while, while voting. But it's true that, that it's very different to manage hopes so managing hopes or ideals within a campaign is one set of uh, one set of actions and of tools. But then, how do you transfer that? Making sure that that the hope is authentic, that that the energy is enough so that someone gets out of the house, puts their trust again in a politician, but not so high as to not be able to deliver. And then the first part of the term becomes a disappointment. In our case, what we did is that we pushed high the the vision. Uh, which for us meant quality of life for Romanians, but also anti-corruption, because we ran on a very strong anti-corruption platform. But then we always said in the campaign, this is going to take time. We're not going to be able, you're not going to see the full solution in the first month. You're not going to see the first solution in the first half a year. And I, I think this is something that didn't lose us too many votes. I think quite the opposite happened, that people appreciated that we don't come with these huge promises that they are reluctant on us actually seeing them through. But one thing where I see not only in terms of our um, the people that support us, the citizens, but also in terms of our membership, is that our membership is even more sensitive to what we're doing because it's once they stepped into this new form of, of politics, most of them have never been party members before uh, joining us, is that they feel a strong identity with the party and what we're doing, therefore are easily disappointed when what we what we say or what we do forward makes them question whether we are actually the ones able to deliver on that on that big dream. And we were able to manage that quite well through internal processes of conversation, co-working groups, so making sure it's a shared decision, it's a transparent process on one hand, but also we're very, very, very careful on the symbolic decisions that we make that they don't signal us moving away from the value set that we're having. Because people, I think we can grow patience uh, in people in coming with us along the way of solving the issues and actually the day-to-day -day action and decisions, but I don't think they're ever going to be patient or forgiving when it comes to us moving away from our core set of values in any set or form. Yeah, that makes sense. And I guess in the United States, Zach, it's a little bit different in the sense that um, President Biden certainly harnessed the energy of um, progressives within the Democratic Party and they, um, people like um, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Senator Sanders did of course support Biden um, on the road to the White House last year. So, but then again, you know, were there doubts about how much he can deliver? Yeah, I think um, this is a huge problem uh, in American, oh, uh, can yeah, you guys no, hear me? Yes, oh yeah, I can hear you. So how, I mean, where does this, like the hopes and the dreams 
I'm sorry, it could be my, and um, my, I might be a little bit um, freezing up here. How do the hopes and the dreams of the progressive ideals or um, you know, um, progressive torchbearers within the Democratic Party, how are they gonna fare under the Biden administration? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, and I got to try to answer it in a streamlined way so I don't go on a long time, but, uh, <laughs> but it's, but there's so much going on right now and that, you know, that, that, that question feeds into, I think one thing that Oana said is so important that, um, it's way better if a leader or a political party says, this is what I want to achieve but it's going to take a while and we're only going to be able to do it if we get this much support, right? We're not going to be able to do it with 10% of parliament, or we're not going to be able to do it with in, in America with, um, you know, only 50 seats in the Senate, like the Democrats have today. And the, the, the big mistake that the, that Democrats and progressives keep making in America, I think, is, is that they're, they're not doing that. They're not doing exactly what Oana said her party's been doing. They're, you know, they're not leveling with the people. They're not, they're not being honest and direct about here's what we need to accomplish this. And it's interesting because conservatives and, and right-wingers tend to be better at that in the United States anyways. Like Donald Trump said, I'm going to fight for you. I'm gonna fight to build a wall. I'm gonna fight to deport all immigrants. Um, and he didn't achieve either of those things, but people, his supporters saw him fighting and that was enough for them to, that was enough to maintain their support. So the Democrats have been making this terrible mistake over and over again. Um, and, per, and this includes progressives, uh, that, that they, they, they don't promise, you know, they, they, uh, sorry, they, they don't articulate a big vision or a big dream that they want to fight for. Uh, and this is part of why they lose uh, up front because pe people aren't excited enough to vote for them. Uh, and then, um, and then they don't show that they're fighting for this for that big goal. And instead, they try to scale back what they're trying to accomplish to line up with just what's possible. For some reason, they just don't understand this basic idea of you know negotiation that if you want to get here, then shoot for here, and then maybe you'll get here. Instead, uh, you know, they they shoot for here because they don't want to disappoint or something, you know. Um, so and, I'm going to play a little bit know. of devil's advocate because I want to actually yeah. focus in on that point about what you said. I mean, is that a little bit an, a, more of an appropriate advice for people in civil society and activists rather than politicians? Because if you look at the U.S., right, I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it is sort of a conservative, moderate country, right? I think the recent Gallup poll showed that, you know, the ultra right and then sort of the progressive segment in the population, you know, don't come close to anywhere near making a majority. Most people are middle of the road and moderate, right? Well, I think most people are moderate when it comes to these divisive issues, you know, that that mostly have to do with rapid culture change, you know. So, you know, there's this is an old story, you know, this story has been going on on both sides of the Atlantic for 200 years. There's this rapid cultural cultural change and usually the people in the countryside have a little, you know, uh, have a harder time keeping up. They get uncomfortable and so you get parties that represent them versus parties that represent the people in cities that are really into the change, right? Um, and so that's something that we have here. But when it comes to the basic issues of, of how do we build our economy so that everybody has a decent means of making a living? You know, how do we get wages up? How do we create better jobs? And that is a place where the Democrats and progressives right now are totally united in theory. Uh, you know, Joe Biden's plans for the environment and the economy line right up with uh, the Green New Deal that that I was, uh, I, I played some part uh, of uh, launching, you know, with with AOC. Uh, and, and so, so, you know, so right now, every, everybody's united around that. So we're, we're in this moment where the centrist Democrats, like the people around Biden and the progressives like AOC and the others that she leads, 
could unite around a really big vision and they could go for it. But they're not doing that. And they're not even doing that wonderful thing that Oana's party uh, has been doing, which is, you know, leveling with the people. Here's what we could do. Here's how many jobs we could create. But we need 10 more seats in the Senate. You know, um, and, and the truth is we don't even need 10. The Democrats need like two more seats in the Senate uh, to, you know, to be able to accomplish whatever they want. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give Alana one more question and then it's great. We already have a few questions in the QA box. So I'll start going to those immediately after. Alana, I mean, Zach mentioned sort of the rural urban divide and a lot of the trends that we see in the US also we you know we see those um, um, fissures in Europe as well. And you did mention it. I mean, how do you reach out to perhaps parts of the population that feel left behind and how do you convince them that your values for your party or your progressive politics make sense for populations. They may not be in cities like Zach mentioned. Okay, so we also share uh, what Zach mentioned in a sense in which most of our um, our supporters actually live in, in big cities, in the capital and in developed cities across the, the country. So that, that's the core that we're having. But something that is very different in European politics and especially in our case is because we are a multi-party system we were able to, to let's say, take this, this path of, of making sure the dream is big, but that we don't oversell in terms of what we can do and that we just don't play any motion because we would have never been able to have 50% plus majority of votes to be able to get into government. Although that was always our objective. So our objective was always that we govern, not that we just push forward ideas and we see when they mature. Uh, but that even we are, if we are a minority party, we now are part of a coalition with a mainstream older party that we fought against for a long time, by the way. Uh, okay. And we were able to, to get into to government with this type, with this type of setup, which makes it even more difficult in terms of how much do we stay strong to the things that we said in the campaign, because now we partner with someone that's only partially close to us in terms of even uh, principles and values, not just in terms of, of action or ideology, right? But, but I'm gonna, so I just wanted to put that as a context for our American participants. But coming back to your question, so that, so we, uh, first of all, one thing that we realized, especially due to the fact that we campaigned, we had four campaigns, so European uh, parliament, uh, local campaigns, presidential campaign, and the parliament. So we had four campaigns in a two year frame uh, and the last arm of those campaigns, which is the mo most important of them, the parliamentary campaigns that, that give the government basically, were done during the pandemic, which meant we did almost no offline campaign. So when we realized this is the case, we simply had to be very honest with what we can do. And we said, okay, in terms of rural, there's very little we can reach through, through online. Uh, not because there's no access. So Romania has one of the best internet uh, access in the world. And even in terms of smartphone or phone usages, we have something more than 1.5 per citizen or something. So, so we're quite mm -hmm. in terms of access, but rather in terms of the channels that we're using or the type of messaging that, that we're having, how, how relatable we are, right? So we said, okay, we're gonna have a part that, that we are gonna reach now. And we did that almost exclusively through the members that we were having, right? So someone that's close to your community that you trust and therefore that you can transfer trust through that person to us. So, so that was one, one tactic. And the other was to understand that there's a part of the population that we can't reach without losing our, our city audience because we just simply couldn't adapt the messages to all those targets. And we didn't have the financial means to like, do it super diverse in terms of, of targeting or execution. And we said, so for this category of people that we have an alignment in terms of values, we have an alignment in terms of vision, but we're just not able to build this fast a brand that they can trust so they can vote for us versus what they voted and chose for the last 40 years when we were not around. These are the people that we want to convince through the actions that we're making for the next four years. So that's where we are focusing with concrete action communication, reaching out to our local councils for the next four years. So by the time we come back to them uh, in the next elections, they would have interacted with one of us in their local community for these numbers of years. And we have proof of what we, we are doing for, for them because they buy into the dream uh, and they buy into the way of getting there. They just needed a direct interaction with us to so we prove that we're the real deal because they had tons of promises before that, that failed them basically, right? 
So, so that's one thing that's very important. And another thing that's very important is in terms of policy. So now we're on a center right um, government coalition. But for us, the, the social inclusion part is extremely, extremely uh, important. And I'm going to go back. And this is the last thing that, that I'm saying, because I want to be mindful of the time. To one thing that we were discussing in a GMF retreat in Italy when that was, yeah, <laughs> still something that we were doing, uh, is that I think we need to redefine the, the social net. And this is something that I said yesterday in a Brussels event as well, because it's still very much defined as a safety net, which is something that catches you when you fall. But I think if we're able to look at the social net as, let's say, uh, a fisherman net, net let's use that analogy as connections that we have with each other so that when one part of the net moves everyone moves in one direction not something that we use when you already fall because yes the you, you make it less hurtful but it's always more difficult to stand up once you've fallen rather than making sure you have the social connections in terms of labor in terms of community in terms of access to healthcare and education everything that you are so you don't fall at all uh, so we're using that philosophy in the social uh, labor policy that we're having and with a focus on the allocation of the EU money that we're now using for the redesign of healthcare and education. Thank you, Awana. And thanks also for the, um, the explanation. I love it. You know, I sit here in Berlin and we're entering a, or Germany's entering an election campaign and it's the same situation. The parties will duke it out, but then they'll have to be friends if they want to, you know, two or three parties have to form a coalition and a parliamentary system. Um, I'm going to go to the questions. And, you know, the first question actually sort of picks up where Awana left off about, you know, reaching other people. And Zach, this is for you in the U.S. Um, you know, how, can progressives, I'm going to paraphrase this question from Nicholas McLean, how can progressives also reach out to the religious right? Um, how can they, you know, reconcile the politics of Jesus um, about loving your neighbor as your, you know, as yourself and the Good Samaritan? Um, is there a way that progressives could also reach out to, you know, um, um, religious, um, the religious right in the U.S.? Uh, yeah, I think, and, and, and also I, I'm reading the question and uh, there's, there's an aspect of it of, um, you know, isn't there some hypocrisy among the religious right? Uh, because if they want to follow Jesus who helped people and said, you have to help people, why are they trying to deny people healthcare and stuff like that? And it's, it's really complicated, of course. And I've, I actually, I live in the Midwest. I, I, I live in a really uh, conservative Christian community about for half of my time. And, um, and, and I've been following this stuff for a while. And, you know, it, it's interesting because actually I think that on a personal level and in terms of doing stuff in the community, if you could somehow measure it, like evangelical conservative Christians are much more like generous and giving and, you know, serving in their communities, uh, you know, than the typical progressive, you know. Um, I don't think anybody can really measure that, but if you could, you know, they, they do give away more money to charity, for example, but um, not just to churches, but to charities. So, so it's, you know, it's, there's a whole history in the U.S. of how um, religious leaders have gotten hijacked by this kind of, you know, this economic conservative, you know, right-wing libertarian agenda. And um, there's, uh, you know, and, it, and it's really just a story of sort of like political alliances and stuff like that, and people kind of following their their leaders. Uh, but I do think it, it's, a, it's a huge problem that we have this cult cultural split in the US around religion. And uh, it's an additional layer that maps closely to that rural urban divide, except it makes it more extreme because there are a lot of evangelical Christians that live in cities you know, that are of all different classes, of all different races, and, um, and, and they've been getting pulled to the right um, unnecessarily because if you actually go to evangelical churches, um, most of them are really progressive, you know, in, in all the ways that we've been talking about. And, and, um, and they're really wonderful people. And, uh, but the, the Democrats and left sort of, you know, left leaders and left movements, I think really unintentionally kind of scorn um, you know, the religious half of our country. Sorry, I have to, I always forget to unmute. I'm going to ask, stay with you, Zach, because uh, Stefan Liebig, who's a member of parliament here of the left party here in 
um, the Bundestag, the German Bundestag would like to ask you your opinion about um, Congress right now. Um, you know, how is the Progressive Caucus faring, um, specifically also looking at the midterms in 2022, which is right around the corner. There's not a huge um, majority. Um, it's a razor thin majority for the Democrats. Are they losing steam? Do you think that the sort of the, the, the moderates that preach unite and healing are going to have the upper hand versus the Progressive Caucus? Um, well, I think I think that 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 the I think we're in a position where some something really amazing could happen um, because the the major the the Democratic majority in the House is only five seats, and and it's a tie in the Senate with the Vice President being the tiebreaker, so it's one one seat difference, and so there's an an amazing opportunity where any five members of the House and any one senator could get together and say, here's our vision, here's what we really believe needs to be accomplished in the next two years. And we're not, you know, and, and because of the way our system works, they could, you know, um, hold everything up and the entire media would talk about them and what they were asking for. So this is an amazing opportunity, but I don't see anybody seizing that opportunity. And part of that is because of the media narrative that is kind of plugging, you know, the, if, if five people were to get together and if they were sort of on the progressive side instead of the centrist side and tried to do something, the media would say, ah, this is the left and they are trying to ruin unity and they are, um, you know, trying to push this extreme left-wing agenda. And it almost wouldn't matter what those, what that small group would be saying. But there, but I, I think nevertheless, there's an opportunity for a small group to say, here's what we're for. We're for economic development, we're for healthcare, you know, we're for basic things that everybody in America supports and wants, you know, 99%. Uh, and and uh, and they could stand up for that. And I think it would work. I think it would be great. And and if they messaged it in the right way, it it would be a message of uniting and healing. Um, so I'm not sure that we're that we're going to see that, uh, but um, but that's too bad. Yeah, Awada, um, how does that relate to? I mean, I'm sure you concur with Zach about these sort of basic, um, you know, basic services that citizens deserve in democracies. But how do you, um, as a politician, um, work? You know, work with the idea of diversity. Um, my colleague Milena Florea in Romania is asking about. Um, LGBTQ candidates. Um, you, you talked about getting more women involved, but how do you um, work with other um, underrepresented groups? Um, and Zach, you could probably also ask, maybe add some commentary about if there's any lessons or, that you can, um, you know, yeah. share for Eastern Europe. All right. So uh, I think Serbia is a great uh, example, not in terms of LGBT policy, but in terms of representation that, that people thought were impossible so far east, right? So that, that's the case for, for, Romania, for Romania as well. Uh, but I'm gonna be very honest with this and move away from the political uh, cushion. Uh, we have no proactive, uh, let's say procedures or campaigns around recruiting LGBTQ politicians. Uh, at all. We obviously make sure we have zero discrimination in terms of that. And in my case, because I'm one of the co-founders, not on paper, because we had a long, complicated story on how we did the party, but in, in practice, we are a group of co-founders. So I, I was for a long time approving the temporary leadership before local elections within the party, right? So I even got these emails from great, great members saying, hey, I'm a mother of twins. By the way, I'm bisexual. I just want you to know this, whether it's a problem or not. I wanted to make sure I put that that out in the open in case you don't want me in the party just let me know I'm okay so so that huge reluctance right in terms of even for people applying for membership and leadership positions and obviously they got my my full support through it but but now in terms of campaigning or openly campaigning around that in recruitment or in showcasing any of our members uh, as examples that that's something that we're not doing and I don't think we're gonna do for uh, for the next years because we also see so in Romania about 90% something, uh, when you look at the research, have a strong focus around church. 
and I think we still need to do some steps on the educating them that that there is a space of freedom, free of respect for minorities and LGBTQ that that does not come as a war against their religion in any shape or form. So I think we need to do the education before we're able to do that more practically. But in terms of our choices, where our vote goes, we had a very very clear uh, position, although it was unpopular at the time. We had a referendum in Romania to to define marriage as something that's happening between a man and a woman in the constitution. Now we have a more openly definition in the constitution. And we were one of the parties, actually the only one together with Usere, that's part of our land, that we were firmly against that, that referendum and we were firmly against the, the, the constriction of that definition. And that meant that through all the following campaigns that we had, the church uh, openly was against that uh, at some point based on that position that we were having, right? So, so that, that, that's one thing and that's where we stand here. I'm currently working with uh, one of the NGOs that's representing LGBTQ rights. We're working on making sure that, that the policy um, reflects that. Uh, but we're not doing that, uh, pushing a lot of drums around the, the topic, uh, let's say. And I would say that not even in terms of women, we're not doing such a great job necessarily as a coalition. As a party, I'm very proud of what we've done. So we are now having the first president of the Senate, a woman, and she's my from my circumscription from Bucharest, and she's the first in history to be there. Uh, but, but even in my case, right? So it, it can my my presence here in the talk as a representative of the party might be a token of women or young representation, but that that's not so much the case. It's happening because I'm one of the let's say co-founder groups, but I'm the only one that has been voted in the national bureau, which is the top leadership of the party. We're a bit more of us, but due to uh, a direct assignment from from the president. But in terms of direct votes, I'm the only one that had that. And in terms of the chairing of the commissions in the parliament, which is let's say a leadership role within the parliament that we're having in the chamber of deputies from our leading coalition i'm again the only one in 16 of us uh in terms of government we also manage that out of 12 ministry we only have one woman and that doesn't come from our party so we're not doing a good job in that as well uh, either i'm rather i wouldn't say disappointment because that's too much of an emotional world uh, but I would definitely say we're far, far away from what I imagined would be the case in terms of actual representation based on the efforts that we did, because we did the efforts, but we didn't necessarily bring home uh, the results. It doesn't feel special and it doesn't feel good to be the only one, right? Appreciate your candid <laughs> remarks. Um, we have a little less than 10 minutes. So for those of you that are logged on, feel free to send a few more questions. I'm going to take two questions at a time because they're somewhat related. Um, David Metzger in Germany is asking about um, the, you know, the system, the two-party system in the U.S. and, rep, you know, parliamentary systems in Europe and how do they um, work with um, grassroots movements, um, you know, is one better than the other? How do they include uh, or harness uh, progressive movements like the Sunrise Movement in the United States or Fridays for Future in um, Europe and I believe also in the United States? And then I guess the second question which relates is how social media um, has always been a force that um, progressive movements have used, um, but how do um, progressive politicians actually feel about social media today and its role in democracies? Um, maybe Zach, I'll let you take those two questions first and then we can go to Alana. Sure, um, I th you know, I, uh, on the system question, you know, which is the best system? Uh, I, I think really you just have to work with whatever system you have. And there's, uh, you know, within limits, there's, there, there are positives and negatives to all different systems. And, uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it's not an answer that very many people like because, you know, in, in the US, um, just about all progressives believe that, um, you know, and pr probably all Democrats believe that a multi-party system is better, you know, and would be better for progressive politics. Uh, but but I, I don't think that that's uh, necessarily true at all. I just think you have to use our system differently. And and it actually has really big benefits sometimes, like, um, like the situation I was just describing where um, just, uh, well, I mean, you know, the fact that we have all had to work within the same party um, in, in this last cycle, it's resulted in 
um, Joe Biden, like really taking on some amazing uh, policies and just really going farther than anybody thought he ever would. Um, and, and, and a lot of that came out of the way that AOC and Sunrise and some of the other groups you mentioned um, and, and a lot of other progressive leaders, you know, were able to push him from, from within the party. So I really think it's, you know, it, it depends. And um, uh, let me, uh, let, me uh, let Oana answer the social media question. Partly because I forgot it. So sorry if you also <laughs> forgot it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, basically, I want to, you know, um, it, it seems like technology is something that has been a great tool for progressive movements, progressive politicians. But um, we've been learning now throughout the years that um, social media also has its um, negative, <laughs> negative aspects as well in democracies. How do you feel about um, social media and what role it plays in? Um, yeah. Uh, moving an agenda, but also the role it plays in democracies. Yeah, so for me personally, um, also in my, my term, but also as a chair of the Labor Commission, it's extremely useful. Also, it's a very fast way to get feedback, for example, on the proposals or actual ideas of implementation. We also have a formal process that at the parliament, but it's so old school and people got so used to being ignored in using the formal letters that, that again, they almost don't engage in it at all. So the social media, not just for us, but for our party has been a way of getting people engaged also in the policy design process uh, a bit more because it's friendly, it's in their newsfeed, it's across pictures of cats and that makes policy also a bit more, uh, you know, <laughs> not, not something aloof, distant uh, that you can't connect to. So, so that's the, the good part, the good part of that. The bad part, or let's say the the, I know, the the effect that we didn't anticipate is that now we also see an extremist party rising. It's called AUR, which is the Romanian translation for gold, uh, that are very much pushing a nationalistic extremist agenda, anti-vaccination, anti-protection measures, wearing masks and so on. And they're extremely good in social media. They're there whenever someone is upset uh, or protest or something is happening, they're there with the phone broadcasting. They have no responsibilities in terms of government or local elected officials, therefore no responsibility on delivering anything. So they're, they're a great outlet for the anger. They're a great outlet for the, the things that people are feeling. And especially now after the pandemic, there's a lot of uh, you know, also negative emotions that have piled up. There's a significant level of fear towards the future. Uh, and what we need is, let's say, trust and collaboration that we build the, the, the recovery and resilience plan and the new scenario that the country is going to get into. And obviously on social media, it's way faster to push fear and panic buttons. So uh, here we see, we see social media play a very, very strong role in, in that. Okay, so I have two more questions before we close. And I think, Zach, I'm going to have you answer both. And then, Awana, you can take um, the second one as well, because it's pertinent to Europe. I guess the first question is specific to the United States about from Juan Lopez about MAGA supporters. They're pretty um, united against anything that, you know, with the label progressive. Um, and even some immigrants are a little bit skittish about um, leftist politics or progressive politics, even in the black community, we've seen that to be um, a trend. So um, how, you know, what is the messaging that needs to get out there? I mean, you talked about it a little bit before, but maybe you can go back and just reiterate what, what is the messaging, what it should it be to, you know, coax people on the other side of the aisle to convince them that progressive politics is good for them. And then the second question is about, you talked about this a little bit about um, the grass, um, this is from Verena Ringler in Austria, um, how, um, you know, the grassroots movements would, you know, the climate agenda be different today if it weren't for groups like Fridays for Future or um, the Sunrise Movement? I mean, how would the strategic policy agenda be different if they hadn't been present? Yeah. Um, well, I, about America just being conservative, I think that, I think in every country, you know, it's the, the, the people's political opinions, you know, in aggregate are, are really malleable and can really go all over the place. Uh, and, it, and, and it all comes down to leadership. Uh, and so if you look at 2008, you know, Obama, I mean, I mean, look, look up the, the vote totals for that 2008 election where, you know, a man named Barack Hussein Obama, you know, the, the first black man to get, you know, very far in a presidential election um, in American history was running against 
like the most respected and revered, you know, war hero alive in America, you know, and and Obama won with with huge margins in all these states that Trump just won with huge margins, you know, so and, and he won by running on very progressive rhetoric. Um, he took some real chances. He took some real risks in the stuff that he talked about and the boldness with which he talked about it. And that's why he won, because he really put a vision out there. Now, in hindsight, it was actually a little vague, but at the time, it sounded really awesome and specific. <laughs> and, um, and that's why he won. And I was in all these rural uh, conservative states during that election, and I saw you know, white working class people who were racist, super racist, you know, like like most white people in America, uh, they they voted for Obama happily. They were so excited, um, and uh, so you know, so I think things really all come down to leadership. And I, I think the problem was that one when Obama was in office, he stopped leading, and he and the Democrats around him kind of went with their instinct that it was better to just play it safe and try to compromise with the Republicans, and you know all that stuff. And so the, so the people didn't get what they voted for and they were very angry about that. So now Oana is a, knows that I'm, I've probably forgotten the second question is going and I'm gonna punt it to her, but no, just remind me, what was it about? It was <laughs> about uh, climate change. How would the climate- Oh, right, yes. Okay, I remember now, I remember. Yeah. yeah, so it was really important that the groups that were involved in the debate around climate change, like Sunrise especially, and you know some of the congressional leaders that rose up, um, around climate change issues like AOC, it changed everything. And it's a really interesting example to look at. Um, and I'm actually writing, I'm trying to write a book on all this right now. It should be out in a, in a few months and then you should all invite me to come speak about it and tell this story in more depth in Europe when we're allowed to travel again. But, uh, but, what I'm, but, but there was this moment when AOC did a sit-in in Nancy Pelosi's office, the leader of the Democratic Party uh, and, and it was such a bold and risky thing for her to do. And she did it with Sunrise. And, and in that moment, it was before she was even sworn in. And in that moment, she released the Green New Deal. And uh, it was this huge vision. And that is what made the difference, right? That kind of leadership on a national scale with the media talking about it, with everybody talking about it, and it was the way they did it because they weren't like throwing blood at Nancy Pelosi. They were actually very respectful to Nancy Pelosi, um, very reverent toward her as they were doing this kind of act of, you know, calm civil disobedience, you know, in her office. So um, it, it was such a big act of leadership with such a, a, a big and well fleshed out, you know, um, well thought out goal that it made it made a big impact on the policies of the Democratic Party. Yeah. Oh, and, I, and is that the same here in Europe when you think about Fridays for Future? I mean, I, I remember, um, you know, Fridays for Future demonstrators speaking to the economics minister here in Berlin with uh, Minister Altmaier. I, do, do you feel that that, you know, it also changed the dynamic here in Europe about thinking about green um, investments? Yeah, definitely. But I have to be, if you would allow me again, a bit very direct in a sense. It always feels, I know envy is the right word, but a bit unfair when you see Americans doing things that in terms of policy are a bit less powerful than the Europeans are doing, but the, yeah. the great branding. Okay. Right? Exactly, I agree. <laughs> I, have, I have to say that, but I'm saying that yeah. respectfully, but it's just a bit, so so we have, so in Europe, right, where now we finished agreeing on the recovery and resilience plans and there's 672 billions on the table and as never before, we decided that 37% of this money need to be used exclusively for climate transition, which I think is huge. We decided that the European Union is going to be neutral by uh, 2050. So again, huge. We were doing some climate things before, not, not everything that I would have liked, but still, I think Europe was a bit ahead of the US, I would say, in terms of that agenda, right? Uh, and it's funny because I think you can trace it back a bit. I'm not sure in the case of AOC as well, although some articles were suggesting that to Mariana Mazzucato partially, right, which is an Italian-American uh, economist. And I think it's nice that she has this double citizenship because she could have, ah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, uh, definitely I think this, have this. I see this in Europe as well, but I just want it as a proud European to mention that I think we were yeah. doing a bit before the branding. Uh, 
So that's one thing. But also when I was campaigning for the European Parliament or now, we see a, a strong overlap of the environment agenda with the young voters. It was, it doesn't matter what I was talking about. I had every campaign event that I had, there was a young person in the audience raising the hand and asking me something about the climate. And I think this has highly influenced some of my older colleagues as well, uh, that maybe wouldn't have had the courage to move as fast. Uh, not because they were old necessarily, but because the, the people that they had in their environment or the voters that they were perceiving in terms of what do they care about, they would have mostly said that the social agenda or the economic agenda are things that matter. But in terms of environment, it's a nice to have not necessarily that people vote on it. And I think one thing that Fridays for the Future have done or even what AOC has done in social media that, by the way, she's quite followed in Romania uh, and Europe as well, uh, they have managed to, to push forward the idea Idea that this time people vote on climate as well. Uh, and I think that has influenced uh, campaigning and in turn that has influenced decisions on policy as well. Well, we're five minutes over, but I think that's okay because we had a great discussion. Thank you so much, Alana. Thank you, Zach. Zach, when your book is finished, please, and we're, the, we're on the other side of this, please do come to Europe and we'll get together, together live with Alana and we can do a panel discussion in front of people face to face. We're waiting for that day. Um, we have great wine, great wine, you remember. <laughs> great wineries, just, just say. <laughs> okay. yeah. Thank you. Invitation has been extended. So um, thanks to all of you that have tuned in. And before I sign off, I also want to give my heartfelt thanks to my colleague, Elizabeth Winter. You may see her name on the screen. She is the mastermind of this series, and she's leaving GMF pretty soon to pursue her PhD. I wish her all the best. And uh, thanks to everybody for tuning in. We'll see you next month. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, Awana. Bye-bye. Okay.